Today, Harvey Comics is best known as the home to characters like Richie Rich, Casper the Friendly Ghost, and Little Dot. But this wasn't always the case. In the 1950s, Harvey was much like any other comics publisher, producing a variety of titles to appeal to as wide of a customer base as possible. Subsequently, the company tackled a number of genres, including humor, westerns, crime, and today's topic, horror. So, how do Harvey's odious offerings measure up against titans of fear like EC and Atlas? Light a torch and join us now as we duck the cobwebs and slip into the Chamber of Chills. Chamber of Chills was an anthology title published by Harvey from June 1951 to December of 1954. Like many comics of the time, the book began life as an entirely different title, taking up the numbering of Chick Young's Blondie, which had run for 20 issues. Like its contemporaries, Harvey had its own stable of creators to call upon, high-caliber artists like Lee Elias, Bob Powell, and Howard Nostrand, who could be counted on to dole out the goods in their own ghoulish fashion. Using a spirit board and planchette, we picked three issues from the archives, so hold on to your gutchies, we're going in. We begin with Chamber of Chills number 6, and what appears to be a thoroughly sweaty yeti. And you thought wet dogs smelled bad. Our first tale concerns horror genre mainstay, Evil Goo. From the blob to Monty Python's intergalactic blancmange, slimy creatures always seem to be out to get us, and nowhere is that clearer than in Jelly Death, with art by Bob Powell, Howard Nostrand, and Marty Epp. Here's Dr. Larson injecting a blob of protoplasm with his latest potion. A startling transformation occurs before his eyes, the protoplasm transforming into a big old snake. And this wasn't part of the plan, so another injection reverts the serpent to its previous form. Still, for a mad scientist, Larson is batting 1,000, so he goes and shares the news with his colleagues. He's overheard by this coal shack type who, eager for a big scoop, sneaks into the dog's lab. As he's always wanted to inject something with a hypodermic needle, the reporter gives the protoplasm a poke with the formula, then helpfully turns his back so it can transform. Taking on the form of a massive arachnid, the protoplasm strikes, attacking the unbelieving reporter. The Doc and his cohorts arrive then, but it's already too late, even after reverting the spider back to its inert form. The others turn on Larson, accusing him of creating a monster to overthrow mankind. And then the cops appear, leaving a frightened Larson with no choice but to escape with his creation. And hey, looks like the protoplasm no longer needs the serum to come to life, assuming a roughly human guise to turn on its creator. Larson stabs the beast with the hypo, but dies before he can depress the plunger, leaving the needle sticking out of the gelatinous horror. Its mouth still wet with sweet human blood, the creature goes on a tear, cutting a murderous swath through the town. Luckily, it's not long before the torch-wielding posse shows up to make things right, stalking the jelly death to a nearby graveyard. Frightened of the search party, the monster inadvertently backs into a headstone, injecting itself with the doctor's serum. And, irony of ironies, he did it against the murder reporter's own headstone. Wow, that's some turnaround. Murdered and in the ground with a headstone in less than a day? This town takes internment very seriously. 
Next up, a frat invitation goes horribly awry in Black Knights of Evil, with art by Joe Serta. In a small New England college whose campus stretches to the beginning of a dark and eerie forest, there exists a secret order. The riders of the night consider pledge Chauncey Ashworth's plea for admission. The riders decide to wind the guy up with a scare, making plans to meet him down at the Devil's Well at midnight sharp. Ever punctual, Chauncey arrives at the appointed hour and is greeted by a hooded specter who leads him to the Devil's Well. Entering a shadowed hut, Chauncey is told to bear his soul so that Satan might enter him. What? No kiss first? The initiate will be judged worthy to join by a spirit the group then set out to manifest, but the whole thing goes sideways when said spirit actually appears. The crimson-skinned skull demon wastes no time in brutalizing the riders with his replica Bat Knight souvenir from Wrigley Field. Chauncey, already on shaky mental ground, loses it as his classmates are murdered and tossed into the Devil's Well. The local constabulary, who couldn't catch a cold, show up and decide that Milksop Chauncey is the murderer. Hey, five pages are up, buddy. Move along so we can get to the next story. Next up, woe to the intruder who dares laugh into the teeth of the Seven Skulls of Magondi. Intrepid plunderer Carl Caruda scoffs at the natives' belief in their god, Magandi. He's determined to steal the string of rubies which adorn the seven-skulled representation of the jungle deity, but the totem's sudden movement unnerves the thief. Even better, the skulls let out a soul-searing shriek which shakes Karuda to his very core. Unnerved, he doesn't notice the tribe's witch doctor slip into the temple behind him. Confronted, Karuda does what you'd expect, firing on the tribesman as he wrests the string of rubies from Magandi's neck. Upon closer inspection, the thief discovers the gimmicked up altar and, pleased with his choice, slips off into the night. However, the witch doctor clings to life long enough to alert the others and initiate a grim ritual. Chanting their god's name over and over again to the infernal beat of the drums, dark forces soon come to bear over the green hell of the jungle. It's then Karuda feels the effects as the chain of rubies around his neck tighten in the sweltering heat. To his horror, the rubies have transformed into seven tiny heads, and they're hungry. In spite of his desperate efforts to be rid of the string, the thief is brought down by the masticating menaces, who, in the end, let loose with their blood-curdling cry of victory. It makes you wonder if that Wortham guy might have had a point. In our final story of the issue, we head over to the Dungeon of Doom. No, it's not some iffy BDSM club only open on Sundays, but instead a portal into madness. Subway driver Larry Frost bonks heads with another passenger during the morning rush. The resulting knock is a shock to Larry, but not as much as his unsettling vision of the monster that walks among them. Larry brings this alarming situation to the attention of a subway guard who simply laughs at the comment without investigation. After all, Larry has a job to do, and today he's the driver on the Milk Run, a lonely stretch of track with few passengers. Haunted by thoughts of monsters, Larry abandons the car and heads up the tunnel where he discovers a frightening scene. A group of hideous groundings are torturing the woman that he'd bumped heads with only hours before. Placed in a machine, the poor gal is melted, the gooey fate of all who uncover the monster's plot. Understandably shaken, Larry rushes back to his subway car to discover he's inexplicably picked up a passenger. Instead of doing the sensible thing and demanding a token, Larry drives on, leaving him at the mercy of the now-revealed grounding. He, too, is melted, leaving nothing but a skeleton to pull in at the station. Well, hey, at least he got to keep his hat. 
Our second scarifying issue is Chamber of Chills number 15, and boom, we're right back into the goo. Unlike pesky copywritten properties and concepts, goo was pretty much any man's game, and Harvey leaned into it with a vengeance. Late one evening, in the Farnley Experimental Laboratories, two scientists are experimenting on a rare and malignant species of bacteria. Hey, it ain't gonna experiment on itself, am I right, folks? Scientist Fisk is repelled by the bacteria, but Bartlett thinks they're really keen. As Fisk wants to destroy the deadly organisms before they endanger mankind, Bartlett does the only sensible thing, attempting to kill his colleague with a handy knife. All this faffing about leads to the two covered in the bacteria, which exhibits some surprising behavior. The substance quickly expands, swallowing the terrified men. Bartlett, already mad, exerts his hubris over the bacteria, driving it from his own body on to consume his erstwhile lab partner. Now mad with power, the scientist sends this deadly spawn out into the world where it wreaks a sticky havoc. Luckily, this town has more than one bacteriological laboratory where a brain trust headed up by Dr. Hughes formulate mankind's one chance for survival. And no, it's not Hubba Bubba, but instead a different but equally deadly strain of bacteria. Heedless of the potential consequences of this new life form being released, it makes a beeline for the marauding bacteria. Bartlett is unsurprisingly caught in the middle as the two organisms fuse into an inert sludge. Well, not completely inert, as the bubbling goo lets out a blood-curdling shriek, leading the scientists to this bitter reminder of mankind's unwillingness to leave well enough alone. You should have just been happy enough with the watch, man. We follow this up with the vengeful corpse, in which a dying Peter Rich declares his wealth to be spent on a lavish tomb to hold him in death. His selfish children balk at this in spite of a terse warning from the lawyer. They'd just as soon have all the money and the old man's wishes be damned. And so it goes, Rich's corpse placed in a pauper's tomb while the children divvy up the riches. Only the old man has sworn to rise from the grave if his wishes are not honored and waste no time commandeering a subway car to kill one of his worthless relatives. Talk about hands-on. Imagine how effective this guy was alive. Elsewhere, another one of Peter Rich's relatives finishes up a gruesome painting. As she ponders what to title her latest masterwork, the skull-faced figure within emerges from the canvas, driving the terrified young artist out of the window and to her death. Oscar Rich, the only surviving member of the clan, hears the grim news of his sister's passing on the radio and heads to his father's tomb for answers. Lifting the coffin lid only confirms his suspicions. The old man is dead after all. However, just then, a stiff wind forces the tomb door closed. Now trapped alone with the corpse, Oscar has a panic attack, quickly consuming the oxygen in the tiny tomb, and he dies of suffocation with only the grinning skull of his father for comfort. What's next, you ask? Why, it's gonna be The Living Mummies, possibly by Don Perlin. The fates are vague on this one. Flask, Hatcher, and Wade are tomb robbers with a difference. And what a difference. They're quick to abandon one of their number to hungry ants, although I have to wonder how hungry these ants are if they leave that much guy behind. Don't go asking for dessert, ants. The two men place Wade's mangled corpse in the tomb overnight, where a striking transformation occurs. His masticated frame jolts to life in the clotted darkness, the rising mummies around him taking him for a god. Sure, why not? 
Following Wade's lead, the bandage horrors trek into the night, soon encountering the remaining grave robbers. Hatcher attempts to run, but instead stumbles down the hillside and into a nest of hungry ants, who quickly strip him of his ample flesh. This leaves only Flask, who is marched unceremoniously into an Iron Maiden. Were those Egyptian? Best not to dwell on it, as Flask emerges more pincushion than man. Their tombs no longer defiled, the mummies return to their ancient slumber, leaving Wade to shamble off into the night, seeking his final absolution. Grim. We wrap things up with issue 20, and a notable shift seems to have taken place in the title, as you'll soon see. Our first tale, The Clock, concerns watchmaker Cal and the rapidly cooling corpse on the floor. This is... or was Cal's wife Rachel. Taunted by the ticking of the timepiece above him, the gearsmith reflects on happier times. Once upon a day, Rachel meant the world to him. He loved her with all his heart and soul. Only the clockmaker's obsession building a new type of timepiece soon overtakes his daily routine. It's not long before Cal refuses to come to bed or eat meals, his every movement consumed by a strange passion. At first, Rachel copes with these changes, but soon begins to resent the time Cal spends with his curious project. The guy won't even take her to the movies anymore. After missing one too many stooge marathons, Rachel takes matters into her own hands, going after Cal's project before she can unleash the wrath of Molnir. Cal strangles his dear wife, life ebbing with each click of the second hand Rachel's eyes go distant growing wide and white as she expires. She didn't know, couldn't understand, but now, well, now it's all changed. With grim precision and a broken heart, Cal modifies his remarkable timepiece, aligning its chime with the moment of his own, utter annihilation. In other words, time's up. For a palate cleanser, we're treated to two humorous vignettes from Howard Nostrin. Starting in the industry as assistant to artist Bob Powell, Nostrin soon forged his own identity as a versatile stylist who could be counted on to produce quality graphic art on a deadline. We'll get back to Nostrin in a minute, but first, the boomerang of all death is murder. Sounds like someone wanted to be Raymond Chandler. Joe Edgett and Wally Payanon are partners in... something. It's never really made clear what. Anyway, Joe wants to kill Wally, and with good reason. He stands to inherit all of this. Whatever this is. Lacking the confidence to push his partner out of a convenient window, Joe agrees to go on a fishing trip. He'll commit the murder there and make it look like an accident. By accidentally smashing Wally's head in with an oar. Brilliant. It's a flawless plan, but some nearby deliverance type puts the kibosh on this potentially perfect murder. Looks like Joe blew it, but he figures he has one more chance. At Pete's party. Why, it'd be easy enough to just cut his partner's brakes and be done with it. It all seems so simple that he wonders why he hadn't thought of it before. He shares a final drink with his partner at Pete's, then sets out to do the nefarious work. But wouldn't you know it, here's Wally now, catching him red-handed. And, fair enough, Wally has been planning his own murder via poison. It just goes to show you, you can't trust anyone these days. Dark horror shifts to grim humor as we visit the horde-like home of Teddy Cummins in the Howard Nostrand illustrated tale, Lay That Pistol Down. 11 Vandernook Avenue is a very exclusive address belonging to a somewhat eccentric owner. But Teddy Cummins is harmless enough. He just likes to be left alone. Here he is now, in the vast confines of his cellar, surrounded by the musty abundance he considers important. Some might say it's trash, but Teddy only plucks the finest treasures from the city's most aristocratic garbage cans. Live and let live is the motto of his ice cream and potato chip eating brethren, and well it should be. Only one night, Teddy receives an unexpected visitor. 
Godrill, if you can believe, is an observer from Mars who plans on using this house as his hideout until he's learned enough to conquer the planet. Teddy, unnerved by this unexpected visitor, pulls a vintage flintlock from the pile of junk, leaving Godrill to brandish his own weapon. Only the whole thing is a feint. Teddy's piece, a harmless cigarette lighter, leading Godrill to believe that he's bested his captive. But Teddy isn't so easily taken, drawing another pistol on his foe. A fountain of water momentarily disorients his enemy until Teddy can draw a shotgun behind a pile of debris. And surprise, it's just another toy unraveling an American flag. Godrill changes his stance then. In spite of his resistance, it's clear this old man is of no consequence to his plans of world domination. Why, even the ridiculous atomic pistol he now brandishes is an object of amusement to the Martian who has a good laugh until he's consumed in a corona of red-hot fire. Turns out Teddy isn't just a harmless kook. He's part of an advanced force of Venusians who plan on claiming this junk pile for their very own. It only goes to show you, don't mess with a hoarder. We conclude this epidermis crawling episode with a little something called End of the Line. It's date night for George and Clara, all abuzz over an exciting evening out with pals Emily and her husband. They share the subway car with this dapper fellow who has a curious look on his face. Clara expresses her concern that the gent is trying to flirt with her, setting short-fused George right off. He grabs the guy up by his lapels, exchanging some harsh words. Clara begs George to rein it in, but the bigger man is hot and forces the wry-looking passenger off the car. Out on the platform, the two continue to struggle with George having the definite advantage. In spite of Claire's pleas, George pummels the other man until he tumbles into the path of an oncoming subway car. When the cops show up, the two claim the death was an accident and flee the scene. Shaken, they appear at their friend Emily's home, only for Clara to break down. Concerned, Emily leaves to make her troubled friend some coffee, but a telephone call stops her in her tracks. It's the police informing her that her husband is dead, something already all too clear to George and Clara. So yeah, as you can see, the book shifted gears towards the end, abandoning the over-the-top horror for something more adult and EC Comics oriented. Was this change motivated by dwindling sales, or perhaps an inkling that, with the advent of the comics code, it was all about to change? Chamber of Chills only lasted four more issues before it was rebranded and abandoned to the garbage tip of time, but man, what a ride. The stories presented here are the merest examples of the goods the company was capable of producing, and all of their pre-code horror books are worth a look for the hardcore comics aficionado. As for me, well, it's time to blow out the candles and hit the coffin, but you can bet that I'll rise once again next week at breakfast. <laughs>